the Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's show, the third and final installment of our series on the global crisis in local news with our partners at the Index on Censorship. On the first two shows, we heard about how local news outlets are in crisis all around the world, both from declining advertising revenues and other restrictions on press freedom. We also talked about how damaging this is for democracy, as fewer reporters are covering local and regional governments in a substantive way. Now, that was all kind of a downer. So on today's program, we're going to be taking a look at some possible solutions to the problem. In a few minutes, we'll hear about a number of innovative local news startups in different places around the globe. We'll also learn about how artificial intelligence and machine learning may be able to actually improve local news. But first, we're going to learn about how, how some ways journalists can combat increasingly sophisticated disinformation and fake news circulated on social media. Technology is now allowing people to create deep fakes or videos that can appear to show real people saying or doing things that never actually happened. So for more on this, we're going to bring in Raymond Joseph. He's a freelance journalist and media trainer in South Africa. He wrote about this in the most recent issue of the Index on Censorship, and he joins us now from Cape Town. Raymond, welcome. Um, good evening. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Well, it's our pleasure. And before I get to deep fakes, I wanted to ask you first about the local media environment in South Africa, outside of the big cities, outside of Johannesburg and Cape Town. Where do people get their news and information? How are those news or agencies faring? So, so pretty much in, in the third world, um, radio, radio is king. Um, and we've got a pretty strong... Um, community radio com community radio sector and there's also a lot of small town newspapers news sheets small publications um, but they they, re they really are struggling the advertising model they never got much advertising to start and the model's broken anyway um, the real threat that they're facing is increasingly um, they, they, they're getting subsidies, they're getting money from local municipalities who are buying time, but it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword because what we're finding is they're demanding airtime, they're demanding stories in the paper, and wielding the sword that if, you don't, if we don't like what you're doing, we're going to withdraw that money. And and we we just not going to help we just not going to help you and that is really a big threat. But but radio um, is strong. We have twelve. We have eleven official languages in South Africa, and and there is radio in all those languages. And that's where the vast majority of people are getting their news. Well. If I could, we want to transition now to talking about this issue that you wrote about for the Index on Censorship on deep fakes. And these are these videos that are that basically uh, show things that never occurred, even though uh, I guess the technology is so good now that it can make, make it seem like something is very realistic. Talk to us um, about how these get started. Where did this come from? So it originally started in 2017 by, by someone who actually called himself deep fakes, um, deep fake. And, and it really began with producing pornography where, where uh, well-known actresses' faces were being put onto, um, onto actual porn movies, onto actual porn video. And it's it's really that's 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 where you're finding deep fakes, which is really a portmanteau, by the way, for those who don't understand, is deep is deep learning and fakes, where machine learning and artificial independence come together and you get people doing and saying things they never did or ever said. Well, I think we um, have, um, I think if I can pause you just for a second, we have a pretty good example of this. Um, you know, obviously, uh, as anyone who's seen movies recently knows, the technology to create very realistic looking people or monsters doing complex things um, exists. And it's, it's light years ahead of where it was even a decade ago. But let's listen to this uh, deep fake. This is a public service announcement created by BuzzFeed News and the filmmaker Jordan Peele. Now... You see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. 
This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the Internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. And if I could just describe that uh, for our audience, for our radio audience. So this is obviously, it sounds like President Obama talking, and then there's a video that appears to show him sitting in the Oval Office giving this speech. In fact, none of this ever occurred, and it was completely faked See, and, and voiced um, by Jordan Peele, by BuzzFeed address, News. How, I mean, how complex is it to create one of these things, someone. Raymond? Um, look, I don't think everyone can do it, but there's free software and freely available software that anyone with a basic understanding of tech and a bit of AI can create one. Um, the, the scary thing is how quickly it's improving. Because it's machine learning, it improves all the time. Um, but at the moment, deep fakes are not yet a serious issue. Um, in the mainstream media, as they are in porn. But what we've really seen over the years is how um, stuff that began on porn, where there's an awful lot of money to be spent. Um, so uh, e-commerce, all kinds of things began, began on porn that then morphed into the mainstream. And that's the real danger. Um, it's 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 really being it's it's really being worked on there, and 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 it it is coming our way. And There's even no question about and it. even we should say, especially here in the United States, just in the past uh, couple of months, there have been some pretty well known incidents. I don't know that you would call these deep fakes, but you know maybe um, shallow fakes, if you will. There was this video of of the House, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi giving a speech at the Center for American Progress that someone from a far right news site apparently edited in a way to make it look like she was drunk um, and. And then there was also this video of an incident at the White House uh, at a press briefing where the CNN reporter Jim Acosta was asking a question as a White House aide tried to take the mic away from him. The White House, he sort of put his arm out to stop her. The White House itself uh, seemingly edited this video to make it look like Acosta hit the White House aide. I mean, talk to us just a little bit about these shallow fakes. So, so, for example, this one was Jim Acosta. If you play it back really soft, uh, really slowly through there's, there's software that you can do it, you can actually see the transitions. But, but for very ordinary people who don't have access and who don't have the knowledge, it's very difficult to know whether this is real or not. The question you would ask yourself, really, would Jim Acosta really push away, hit an intern in the middle of a, a, a White House press conference, I doubt it. I doubt it very much. And which, which, brings, around the, which brings up the question, I think, for journalists, if I may speak about journalists in particular, it's never been more important to actually do the journalism, to, to actually go back, do a reverse image search, um, take take screen grabs out of videos, go and see where they came from, see who else reported on it. Talk um, to us as well about what sort of the average person can do to identify these deep fakes if they see them. Are there some telltale signs? Well, so, so telltale signs. Look, I, fir I, I first of all think that people should be looking for content from trusted sources. I think that's really important. You know, something flashing around on the internet created by someone who you don't know. We really need to be looking to trusted sources for our material um, because they will have done the verification. But but if you have a if you if you have a look at them very often, so the technology is not quite right yet. And what you'll find is backgrounds are very blurred because they're focusing on the foreground and the face. Um, very often eyes are different shapes, sometimes different colors. People's ears are different sizes. They, they, they're off kilter. Um, jewelry uh, earrings look different on different ears. It's, it's those small telltale signs, but really to expect the public to be doing this is very, very difficult. I think it's a big ask. I mean, um, fact-checking 
amongst ordinary journalists is not something that is being done properly. And to, to expect the, the public at large, I think our duty more than ever as journalists, um, we need to be doing the journalism and we need... Well, Raymond, need I agree. I mean, this, uh, I mean, it does seem like very scary stuff here, but we're just out of time. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us. My pleasure, and thank you very much, and good evening. This is thank Global you. Journalist. On today's program, our final installment on the global crisis in local news. We're focusing today on solutions that can help news organizations thrive amid declining ad revenue, threats to their credibility, and technological change. We just heard Raymond Joseph talking about South Africa and how journalists can combat deep fakes on social media. Up next, we're going to talk some about uh, some new and innovative business models that are being tested all around the world as a way of funding local news. Now, obviously, in bygone days, local newspapers funded journalism by selling classified ads to people who want to sell their used car or display ads to businesses like department stores that want to showcase their wares. Now, the internet obviously has largely killed this model off. So for more on what may be next, we're going to bring in Sally Jimson. She's the deputy editor for The Index on Censorship magazine and has been following some of the alternative ways of providing local news. Sally, welcome. Great to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, well, it's nice to hear that it's not all doom and gloom and that there are some local news outlets that seem to be doing well, that there are some new ideas. And you, uh, you research this issue uh, sort of globally for the Index on Censorship. One of the uh, outlets that you spotlighted was something called La Voz de Galicia in Spain. T talk to us about what, what this does. So La Voz de Galicia, it's a big, it is a big local paper in Spain, uh, but what they've done is to get local, they don't have reporters to go to every local football match or to every, to every fixture. So what they do is they have um, technology, software technology that goes through Facebook and goes through Twitter and takes off um, results of your local football game and then it's fact checked by reporters and then they use it in the newspaper so it's a way of getting it's a way of getting very local what's going on very locally but without actually having a journalist on the spot okay but there must be some limitations to this approach then yes no of course there are limitations to it um you have to fact check it um, it may not, you're, you're using Twitter and Facebook, you're only covering things there where people are tweeting about it and putting it on Facebook, um, you're not covering other things, and you're not doing what we were interested in actually is holding local government to account or holding government to account or investigating um, uh, corruption or things that are going on locally. So it simply is, how do you, it simply is looking at um, things that are going on very locally in, in communities. Um, um, pulling it off Facebook or Twitter, um, fact-checking that, and then putting it in the paper. Okay, well, good. Well, you highlighted uh, this other new site that uh, some of our audience may be familiar with. It's called The Voice of San Diego. San Diego, obviously, is yeah. a big city in California. This metropolitan newspaper, the San Diego Union-Tribune, has just been through wave after wave after wave of layoffs of its journalists. So, I mean, how, how is this Voice of San Diego trying to fill the gap? Well, so this is something different. This was this was set up by a Union Tribune columnist who um, decided that he was going to look at newspapers in a different way. So this is not a profit making model. This is a non profit making model. Um, it's about getting. It's about um, having that a, a much closer relationship with your um, readers than uh, you would have had in the past. Um, and it's about setting. It's about having community discussions. It's about getting people feeling that um, they're part of uh, that. The newspaper is part of that civ of civic life. Um, so that's what that's that and, and, and you get people pay for it and you get subscribers that, that subscribe to it. So it's owned by it's it feels that it's owned by its local community. OK, so this is so it's a nonprofit. So it's getting the readers to actually pay for the journalism rather than the advertisers then. Exactly. And I think there are some foundations which give it money, but it's essentially it's an it's a nonprofit and essentially it's saying we have our readers who are going to support us to do this and we're going to help our readers to be good citizens through uh, that will be part of one of our missions to make our readers good citizens. 
You also uh, identified another news outlet. This one's in India. It's something called The Voice of Chhattisgarh. I understand that this is local news that can be brought to people in the countryside who don't have smartphones, but maybe just have sort of the basic clamshell uh, phones. Yeah, so this won one of our Index on Censorship Awards. It's a radio station. Um, it's a ra- it's, it's radio in the sense that you ring up, if you live in a tiny isolated village in India, you can ring up on a phone and you can phone in a story. And then that story is fact-checked. And if it's right, it then goes on to, it, it then is broadcast to other people who can get the story by ringing up a phone. So it gets past problems like um, difficulties with licensing um, radio stations, for instance. And then it goes on to a... So someone in an individual village then can call in and say, there's been a major flood in my village and this is what has happened and this is what the damage is. And then that report from the villager can be rebroadcast to other people after it's been fact-checked, if you will. Exactly. So, yes, exactly. And then they will ring, they they will get that broadcast through phoning on them on their phone to get that as well so they don't have to have a radio to do that they can they can ring up and get that and that i think is that sort of using voice in that way rather than having rather than reading is really important in communities where there's um uh, a lot of um a lot of illiteracy but and still so i mean there's some where there, there local languages um, there is some cost involved though so how how does it pay for itself so a lot of this is paid through. Um, I think this is paid through um, foundations as well. So this is not this is not paid through via advertising. I think there's a German newspaper that you highlighted called uh, Tagesspiegel uh, Lüte, which tries to do hyper local news in an electronic format uh, and have uh, reporters in neighborhoods, and so it gets sort of t- to hyper local news. Talk talk to us about the the model that they have. Well, this is Loiter, in fact, in German. <laughs> it's Loiter, and what it has is it, so it's, it's specifically in Berlin. There's a lot of competition in Berlin in terms of newspapers, so a lot of competition for advertising. And I think really the Tagesspiegel's probably won that competition by um, by getting, um, uh, re- putting reporters in the 12 districts around um, Berlin, so dividing Berlin into 12 districts and putting reporters in there and getting them to report on very, very local news that's going on there. So it's things about putting a cycle lane in, in, in a part of northern Berlin or doing up the playground. So again, very, very kind of very local news that's going on, Not in, not necessarily investigative, but certainly... Um, but certainly telling um, readers what's going on. And that goes out in a newsletter. So what you do is you say, I live in Pankow or Prenzlauerberg in Berlin, and um, you um, subscribe to that area newsletter, and then you get a newsletter telling you, this reporter specifically telling you what's going on. And this is supported by advertisements then? And this is supported by advertisements and specifically, and so their model is to try and get very local advertising. So the local butcher, for instance, in that area will want, will advertise in that newsletter and it may possibly even in the paper afterwards because um, of the, because then there's news that's happening in their very local area in Berlin. Well, obviously there must be different neighborhoods have different resources. I mean, can this pay for itself when the reporter is covering a poor neighborhood? Well, of course, that's the question is, you know, do you get more news out of poor neighborhoods? Obviously, at the moment, this is being um, financed by the Tagesspiegel itself. But I think that's the danger. And in all these models, I was looking at the danger. In many ways, it's horses for courses. So, uh, yes, in Berlin, that may be fine because you've got the mother paper, which is which will will cross subsidize the areas and the rich areas and the poor areas. But you have to ask, will actually the poor area news get? less coverage than the rich area because the rich area will bring in the advertising and i think the same is true of places like the voice of san diego you know if you don't have a a civic and engaged community will 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 that will that model work there will, would that model work in a less engaged community well it's sort of uh, it's an interesting and diverse slate of different companies trying to do this but sally jimson we're out of time i want to thank you so much for joining us Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this. A reminder that you're tuned into Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's program, we're talking about some solutions for the crisis faced by local news organizations all around the world. 
Now, if you're interested in more Global Journalist, check us out online at globaljournalist.org. There you can find our archives and additional coverage of underreported international news and human rights issues. You can also like us on Facebook, where we live stream, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, or see our videocast on YouTube. Now, in this next segment, we're going to look at artificial intelligence and how the use of AI and machine learning can be used in the news to help local journalists cover stories they might not otherwise report. So for more on this, we're joined by the journalist and author, Mark Frary, whose article, The Future is Robotic, appeared in the spring edition of the Index on Censorship magazine. He joins us now from London. Mark, welcome. Hi, Jason. Great to be here. Well, uh, you write about artificial intelligence being used to write the news. How is it used right now by news organizations? It's, a, it's an interesting one. I'm, uh, my, my background is actually in technology. I was actually a, a nuclear physicist before I became um, a journalist. So I've always had um, an interest in, in technology. And it's interesting now to see how artificial, artificial intelligence has really come of age. It's been around for a long time, many decades. But um, now um, organizations are starting to realize that um, they can actually use it to help uh, journalism get out of the difficult situation it is, and particularly local journalism. Um, as as I know that you've been talking about, local local publishing has had um, a, a challenge in recent years because of falling circulations and uh, decline in advertising. And um, they're looking at AI as being a potential um, way out of that situation by the use of things like robotic reporters or computer-aided reporting tools. And um, so report, robotic reporters, this is something that um, Bloomberg has been doing, for example, and um, one of their managing editors recently said that actually now 25% of their stories are actually being touched by AI and robotic reporting tools, that things like uh, financial uh, releases, where the actual skeleton of the story is is very very similar and because uh, they want to get the story out very very quickly because um, you know the market is very sensitive to this sort of news they just want to get the the, um, the story out there as quickly as possible and AI enables them to just plug in the numbers into that template and perhaps you know even as much as you know including a quote from the from the CEO or the CFO it's very very easy to do because those stories are very templated well, talk to us then. So clearly, uh, robotic reporters can do earnings reports. I understand the Washington Post actually generates sports stories now using uh, yeah, artificial intelligence as well. Yeah, I guess um, it's it's a similar idea actually to to the financial releases. Um, you know, the you know sports results particularly. Um, maybe not where there's um, you know a an expert who's having to put um, you, know, you know their view on how the game has gone. But um, you know, if we were just looking at you know college sports results, that sort of thing, it's very easy to generate that story. It can in be the same quite way, formulaic. Absolutely. Well, well, what, and, are, well um, what are some kinds of stories that artificial intelligence can't do then? I think um, you, you know. I do do think AI has a role in uh, um, news reporting. What um, what it has a challenge doing, and you know, I, I write a lot of uh, travel pieces, for example, and um, you know, it's very difficult to generate that using artificial intelligence because you know it's a very emotional uh, topic, and you, you have to sort of get across your your experience and um, you know some. A sort of a dream about a place that you want to go on vacation to, for example. So I think those sorts of um, articles are always going to be very difficult to to generate um, using artificial intelligence tools. Well, I mean, to a lot of people, this would, I mean, it sounds a little bit creepy, like kind of a bad sci-fi movie that you have robots writing the news. <laughs> but you argue in your piece that it's actually, it may be a good thing, both for news consumers and for, for journalists and news organizations. I, I just look back um, 25 years when I was first, um, you know, a junior reporter on, on magazines and some of the stories that I had to, to do then, you know, they were very, very time consuming, required a lot of legwork, um, you know, out of the office. And um, you know, it's getting very difficult to do those sort of stories now because journalists can't afford to take the time away from their desks, perhaps. And... Um, you know, AI is going to help us because there's there's this um, enormous amount of information out there, and AI is very good at um, finding useful nuggets of information. And uh, so, what what it's going to enable us to do is that junior reporter who's now tied to um, to the desk, um, they can use tools like that to bring in lots of 
different sources that may, maybe they have access to already, but um, do it in a very curated and filtered way so that they can save time. Um, and, and that time is so valuable to them. They, they only have um, eight hours in, in a day. And, um, you know, that's going to enable them to do the, the bits of the story that do really need human input. Um, and so, you know, it might bring together sources like, um, you know, the local uh, police blotter um, news feeds like that, social media feeds, and um, bring relevant information about particular stories that they've set filters for um, all into one place on a desktop. And this is what some of these new tools do. Um, you yeah, know, I think you mentioned in your article, a tool keywords. called Curzana, which actually it does it does some of this. Talk to us about how this works. Yeah, so um, it has, um, you know, thousands of different feeds from di different organizations. So it may have, um, you know, uh, the, the local authority um, uh, feed, news feed. So uh, reporting from what's gone on in, in council meetings, for example, but uh, also um, it's social media feeds from various people and, and you know, geographically tagged as well. So you can you can set something up in advance saying, well, I, I'm, I live in Missouri, for example, if you're a journalist there, I'm interested in stories that are only about Missouri and maybe even on a more hyper local level, you can pick uh, one particular uh, town or, or city and um, only see information relevant to that area and bring it all together and the, the artificial intelligence sort of secret source in this is is identifying what might be interesting and some of these tools actually you know they 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 check you know what the story is like and whether whether people actually like it so some of these have the tools have humans involved in the project as well there's another one called inject that does this where they actually have humans sort of reading the outputs of, of these things and saying, well actually this this story is interesting and this so this one is sort of using crawling through social it. media then it's able to get rid of a lot of the flaw i mean there's just so much stuff yeah. then a lot of it is junk on social media that it's not helpful at all so this helps get rid of all that that's right. There's um, there's a hyperlocal uh, publication called the uh, West Bridgeford Wire in uh, uh, in the UK, and um, they're they're making a very successful use of uh, the Krasana tool. Um, and why they're successful is it um, it gets them the story out quicker. So obviously, in this sort of online world that we're in now, get being first is so important, you know, because that's that's the one that everyone clicks. Um, so if you see that on Facebook or Google News or something, that's the one you're going to click the one that's at the top of, of the ranking. And so um, tools like this enable small organizations and publishers to get to the top of that list before anybody else. And so um, and, and with that extra traffic that they're getting from being first, they're actually able to build a sustainable model for themselves um, funded by uh, local advertisers because they're interested in that very hyper localized traffic. Well, it sounds like there's some reason for optimism then. I think so. I mean, you know, here in the UK, we've lost um, 245 newspapers um, in the last uh, 14 years which you know it's a shocking state and there's been a lot of consolidation and takeovers but among the, the various local news publishers um, I think you know it's enabling small organizations to be very innovative um, in this area so like um, the, the case I just mentioned you know that's that's really one one or two people just on their own and so these are very sort of slim down organizations and maybe a model for the local news publisher of the future we're out of time for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Mark Ferry, Sally Jimson, and Raymond Joseph for joining us. Our producer this week is Edom Kasae. Visual editor is Megan Smaltz. Aaron Hay is audio engineer. Travis McMillan is director. Special thanks to Rachel Jolly of The Index on censorship. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.